graduate committee for her master's degree, which she entered in 2018. Uh, she started at Cornell um, in the So thank you all again for being here. Apologies for not starting at the mic. Um, yeah, so my name is Shorna Allred. Really happy to be here to um, introduce Gloria Blaze, who is an amazing um, student. And you'll hear more about her research here in just a moment. Um, but she earned her master's degree uh, here in the Department of Natural Resources and Environment in 2020, where she did a research project looking at the um, impacts of community-based agroforestry in Haiti and really understanding what those um, the outcomes of those interventions can achieve for both uh, social ecological outcomes. And she has continued that work in her doctoral program to really um, lean into the uh, health dimensions of community-based agroforestry um, and also the policy, how we should be shaping policy to, um, to really impact the people of the country where agroforestry practices are implemented. Uh, before coming to Cornell, Gloria earned her uh, bachelor's degree from Rutgers University. Um, she's here as she's a Gates Millennium Scholar throughout her uh, master's and doctoral program. And she's really amassed um, an incredible tableau of experience in both teaching, research, mentoring, policy, and uh, research coordination. Um, Gloria has a deep passion for development work. Um, she's very astute uh, leader and uh, also with regard to research project um, leadership and coordination as well. She really has um, an outstanding ability to bring a team of people together. Um, most recently, she was an intern with the United Nations this past summer. Um, she's also um, helped to found a uh, think tank based in Washington, D.C., the Haiti Policy House, which you'll hear a little bit more about um, later. Um, and she also has um, really had an impact on undergraduate students at Cornell as a graduate resident fellow at Carl Becker House and also um, as a co-instructor in the um, Department of Public and Ecosystem Health, um, impacting master's students there. Um, I'm incredibly proud of Gloria for all of her leadership and research that she will share with you today. I have no doubt that she will continue to inform, shape, and transform policy and practice in community-based natural resource management and applying her expertise to the country and region that hold a special place in her heart and also a place that she calls home, Haiti. Thank you, Shorna. Oh, God, guys. <laughs> oh, okay, I've been practicing for this. Um, so thank you, Shorna. Thank you all for being here. I did not check the weather until yesterday. I was like, oh, okay, we're gonna have a great day. But thank you all for being here. Some logistics, um, I mean, I'm wearing all white today. I'm not getting married. I have already been baptized. The purpose of this is to honor my ancestors. And so in the African diaspora, we wear white in certain ceremonies. And so I'm trying to channel that because I need that today. And although this is an academic seminar, I'm going to try to speak in simple terms just for accessibility reasons. And also due to the severity of conflicts going on around the world and my home, I will be using horrible humor to just get through this. And so just fake laugh if you have to. And so, and um, so today we're gonna go over a couple of acknowledgements, then jump into some context of Haiti, and then from there go over the research and then conclude with some recommendations and then the Q and A. And so some acknowledgements, the funders, um, Atkinson, Cornell, Engage Cornell, Inaudi, and of course, Gates Millennium Scholars Program that funded my entire 10.5 year career in college. Um, and also my committee, uh, Stephen and Shorna, you guys have been with me since the beginning. Thank you so much. And also others are Jen Meredith, Louise Buck, and Mark, who are perhaps running us virtually. And also my US collaborators and the Haiti-based collaborators. I know you all aren't here today, but today, Jen, I have your artwork up here. The room today has a bunch of Haitian artwork. I wanted to thank the Rawson family for allowing me to borrow them. They have an amazing collection. If you go to Pittsburgh, they will have their exhibit showing for Haiti between September of this year. Wait, 
next year, September, and, and for a whole 11 months. So if you want to see more of this beautiful art, feel free to go to Pittsburgh and enjoy that. Um, from land acknowledgments, I did have the privilege of attending Cornell, and we know that here is where the Guy and Kono, I'm probably saying that wrong, but this is land that belonged to the Guy and Kono, and um, unfortunately, there, there's, there's still some stuff that needs to be done, but I did want to acknowledge that. And this research was conducted in Haiti. Haiti is where the Tainos lived prior to the arrival of the Spanish colonizers. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, check and check me, right? Thank you. Um, this research was conducted in Haiti, where the Tainos of IT were there before the Spanish colonizers. And of course, unfortunately, that population was decimated um, due to foreign diseases, enslavement, and massacres. And the horrors continued with the importing of enslaved Africans, despite the fact that Haitians did um, abolish slavery. That came at a really steep cost, and that meant more foreign invasion. And the country would go on to experience several injustices, um, leading to what it is today. And so to broaden the scope of this injustice, I can't play this video right now because we are on a time limit. But I want to emphasize that enslavement of Africans and the carving up of Africa that happened thereafter by European colonizers um, is the greatest injustice to have ever occurred in Human civilization uh, for 400 plus years, that is four times 100. I will, not, I will not live to 100, I don't think so. And so the black race was kept behind for four centuries, treated as property and less than human. The numbers are heartbreaking and I am angry. And if you would like more data, you could check out this resource. But this video was showing the record of boats or cargo ships that left Africa between, for the whole period of, of the um, Atlantic trade slave trade and it's it's quite a visual so I'll, I'll leave you to go explore that if you'd like to but um being that there haven't been many projects on Haiti I, I assume coming out of this apartment and so I wanted to take the chance to just if no one here ever goes to Haiti which is probably the case um I do want to acknowledge a couple of Haiti's contributions to the world and so I mentioned earlier Haitians uh abolished slavery in the new world that changed the course of history forever uh, we wouldn't have Kansas City Chiefs today if it wasn't for this because Napoleon had to sell the Midwest. Um, so, and they also helped slavery uh, be abolished elsewhere in Latin America. It's also been a place for refugees throughout history. And Haitians also fought in several wars for the Americans and helped other countries um, gain their independence. And I want to acknowledge that Haitian voodoo, what you see in the entertainment and media, is not really what it is. It's actually quite a very beautiful, spiritual, very nature-based religion that is that stems from Catholicism. And so you see people casting spells in movies and doing crazy stuff. It's it's very 1% of what actually it is. And so also, if you enjoy Chicago, Chicago was founded by a Haitian man and Cornell's first African descended uh, student was actually Haitian. And this is my Haiti. If you never see step foot in Haiti, if what you have is the Western media, which is what most of us have, including myself when I was being raised here in the States, this is the Haiti that I know as well. It's beautiful, the culture is rich. I encourage you to learn more. I have several books lined up in the first row if you're interested in learning more about Haiti. And so delving into today's presentation, I'll go over some Haitian context related information, delve into planetary health, and then looking at what it means to scale for impact and then the usual research topics or components that you have to go through and then we'll end up with a Q&A. And so Haiti today, if you're not aware, is experiencing several shocks. Persistent instability, political instability to be specific, lack of human services and frequent natural disasters. So everyone knows the earthquake that defines Haiti till this day still. And of course, the gang violence currently ongoing that's benefiting a certain population of people that we don't see. And so Haiti represents a planetary health crisis where environment plays a huge influence on overall human health. Planetary health is simply the state of the natural resources that humans depend on to live happy and healthy lives. The concept urges systems thinking to address today's complex problems and you might have probably already heard about nature-based solutions and climate-smart agriculture and why we have to scale them up to have more impact. 
And so there's a suite of practices, including agroforestry, that are likely to be likely to be planetary health solutions. And so agroforestry simply is adding trees to a farm system, simply as that. And so this is the primary practice of interest in this study. And to study how agroforestry and other natural resource management programs are being designed and scaled, um, this research uses the scaling innovation theoretical framework in which, we're, in which I adapt 13 contextual factors that are likely to affect outcomes. And so these factors are on the left side of this diagram here. And so I have 13 for this study. And these factors pretty much determine certain outcomes. And so the whole idea of scaling, they're scaling out, which means to get to more people and communities, scaling up, which means to try to get to higher level institutions and hopefully get to the policy level and scaling deep, which talks about changing norms, cultures, and inspiring people to live differently. And so I use this framework to study the, how impact is achieved. Um, and so this dissertation has four ambitious objectives, but for today, we're gonna to focus on just three. Um, and so that is to um, examine successful models of planetary health benefits, successful models for planetary health benefits, and understand how several programs are scaling their impact in Haiti's context. I complement this by identifying the most suitable areas for scaling out. And so to do this, I took upon me a case study methodology. And sidebar, this is very rigorous, very demanding. It is not easy at all. And so I mix qualitative and quantitative data to do this. And the qualitative data sources included document archives, photography archives, focus group interviews, individual interviews, and various other things. And uh, you'll see the asterisk here. If you weren't aware, um, in 2021, the president was assassinated in Haiti. That's when I had to completely adapt my my project. And so I spent months rethinking, revising, and that was enough to make me want to pause or leave of absence for a little bit, but I did it. But the methods used for this um, study were primarily remote. And so of these data sources that I used for the qualitative component, um, these are the industries that were reflected in the documents that I collected, but also the interviewees that I interviewed. And here is a, a summary of the actual participants. You will notice that more men than women were available during this time, and that more than half of the participants were Haitian, and, and also more than half of the participants worked across multiple sectors. And I want to highlight that I chose to indicate the nationality because, of course, I can't be on the ground. And I want to make sure that um, you are aware that despite me not being on the ground, I was able to speak to Haitians that have had several years' experience in Haiti. And so research question one asked, to what extent are community-based agroforestry health models likely to positively affect community health and well-being? As a reminder, agroforestry has been a recommended solution across several contexts. It is practiced across Haiti and presents itself in various forms, including home gardens known as the Jardin La Coupe. And so more specifically, these models the community-based agroforestry is a form of agroforestry, as you can tell from the title, that is done at the community level, where the risks are shared amongst people, but also social capital is leveraged. And here are some wonderful images of field work, field observations I had back in 2019. And with that being said, I propose a new term for the models that I observed um, for this case study that have integrated both health and agroforestry into their approach. And so community-based agroforestry health models use a holistic approach to tackle pressing rural development challenges, including malnutrition, water conservation, and land degradation. Due to their importance to livelihood in Haiti, tree planting, of course, is a core activity of this model. And so I examined three models, and this table presents the general characteristics of each one. All the models have a US-based partner uh, that, provides, that, provides the health, I guess, that provides the health component to the model. They represent various scales. As you will see, the budget is different across all three. We have one that goes as high as 1 million, the other 150, and the last one 200. And so these models are more than 10 years old and they demonstrate success in the context of Haiti. They provide several services and just take note of the budget because that's probably a key thing to remember as we go along the study. And so before moving on to the actual data, data, I'd like to take this time to remember the incredible people who helped make these partnerships possible. 
they're no longer with us, um, but they made this pos these partnerships possible through funding, passion, and inspiration. Um, the last picture is actually one of my friends, colleagues, and mentors, uh, Mary Olen, who's hugging her father. And that is who I am, I am uh, remembering today as well. And Chris Navy, if you guys know him, he didn't like uh, all tell a joke later, but he was a really nice man that preferred to plant trees in Haiti than deal with actually dealing with sick stuff because he it gave him the ick, you know. Anyways, so based on an in-depth analysis of these three models, uh, I found four major components in their design and approach. First, we have the health, food, and security dimension in which it was observed that producing nutrient-rich peanut butter and targeting communities with the greatest need was a priority. For one of the models, access to health services led to a significant reduction in health, health costs while also reducing the burden of traveling to nearby facilities. And so the peanut butter I talk about, the peanut butter that has been created with the, a lot of nutrients that helps children that are malnourished uh, gain their nutrients back within a certain number of weeks. And special attention was also paid to the education and training of communities. As you read these quotes, I want to emphasize that Haitian people are hardworking, competent, and dedicated people with a huge faith. You give them education and you will get yourself a powerful group of people ready to take on anything, even with their bare hands. So these pictures you see here to the left, you see the actual education and training. In the middle you see up top, you see folks learning how to create a composting pile. In the bottom you see an adorable child that was participating in the tree planting activity that I attended. And to the right, you see a community doing what they got to do because the state is absent. The state is handling their stuff in the capital, but they're handling their stuff back in their communities. And also a key design element in the models was the need to strengthen social ties and empower Haitians to be their own agents of change. In the face of insecurity, this was essential to reduce natural resource conflict and out migration into the violent capitals or violent urban centers. And so as one person said, they were the, the community members before them coming and providing this community-based agroforestry, they were pitted against each other because they were fighting over natural resources or didn't know each other well enough. But so when you start planting together, learning together, it, it really helped them become more, more resilient, more cohesive. And other pictures you see folks actually, as I said, with their bare hands, with the tools they have. And to the right, you see students learning how to play instruments. And through this model, communities came to benefit from ecological and human health benefits. Um, take note in my presentation with these images that I've, that I've collected um, from this case study. Uh, none of these images show people waiting for handouts. Um, there's not a picture of a, starting ch of a starving child being used to be, be I guess, extreme. Um, no one looks disheveled. And so restoring dignity, as one of my colleagues say, is also ingrained in the values and principles of these models. No one acts to be impoverished. These are the results of slavery and other stuff. And so to wrap up this section, the research identified several actors and institutions that were involved and should be involved so as to ensure the effectiveness and lasting impact of the models. I apologize for all this text, but as you can see, we need several actors and several institutions. And on the left are the individuals. So you have up top, you have the community leaders, the Kazakh and Ed Kazakh. And what that is are the unofficial but official government officials that live in the communities that are quite influential. You see for education and training, we have the teachers. And on, on the right side for the institutions, we have the agricultural field schools, the Ministry of Agriculture, Environment. So several actors and several institutions are needed to make these models effective if they were to be scaled out. And going back to the theoretical framework, which had these factors on the left side, looking again at this model, we see how certain factors are more important for, cert for certain parts of this model. And so for the health, food, and security, you clearly need human resources, policies to support them, and of course, collaborations. Um, and so moving on, how are implementers and beneficiaries adapting innovations to responsibly scale their impact in the context of state fragility. What I mean by responsible is we're not just doing it because we're getting paid to do, we're doing it because we know it's going to work, we know people want it, and it's not this very like top down, we're coming in and saving people. And so the question, this question was studied at the national level, moving beyond just agroforestry and including various other natural resource management programs. 
identified three, five stages of these programs, which included pilot, I mean, planning and design, pilots, dissemination, stability, and sustainability. Now, again, these were very ambitious objectives. And so I will primarily and only focus on planning and design because this phase of the uh, program was the most crucial to sustaining and having the impact that these models look for. And so for planning and design, the most critical contextual factors in this stage were social capital, collaborations, time, technical design, and adaptation to local context. And so community leaders, these are the people that are key to rural communities. Without them, you will spend a lot of time and energy planning something that is likely to fail. On the left is a leader meeting, is a, is a leader meeting during several community leaders got together to help the US-based partner plan and design the innovation or the program so that it could meet the needs of their communities. On the right is a picture I took in one of my favorite communities. The leader is in orange and he has been with this community for over 15 years. Um, and he had been a leader at the time that I was interviewing folks and they're standing in the community forest that that community manages. I found that collaborations were not optional. They were necessary. If you have heard of people calling Haiti the Republic of NGOs, then this links right to it. In a place where so much is happening, with very limited resources, you need to collaborate strategically. And as this quote says, you want your program to overlap with several others so that you're not dependent on the capital. And this long quote here, this person made it clear that you can get way more done, more effectively, with more impact if you just work together. And so he describes roads and agriculture. If you have agriculture programs, you want to link markets to your beneficiaries, right? So roads will help you get that done. And so you could be in an area where there's a road construction project and work together, and that will have way more impact than just, we're just here to do our job. And so collaborations also meant working with financial institutions, more specifically microcredit institutions, which are quite successful in Haiti. This particular one, Franco came up a number of times in, in the data that I collected. And so from what I observed, uh, there are hardly any, any defaults on loans and it, it's quite efficient because it supports itself unless there's people stealing money, but I didn't see that. And so project factors in planning and design Technical design, what I mean by this is how natural resource management practices um, are designed in such a way that is in line with the geography and livelihoods of people. This is a 3D render of IT. As you can see, Haiti's side is mostly mountainous. It's as low, well. <laughs> some valleys, but it is mostly mountainous. The DR side has mountains too, but it's much bigger. And so you have Haiti where it's about 75% of the country is on steep slopes. And so that also means that there are several livelihood zones, different activities are happening because of these different um, landscape factors. And so you can imagine that if you design a program and don't keep this in mind, it's, it's going to fail. You have to match it with what people are already doing, correct? And so practitioners emphasize the need to localize projects to the smallest unit of implementation and provide tailored design, whether it be for individuals, communities, or watersheds, keeping in mind that mountains create different microclimates. You want to build on what people are already doing and just work your way up from there. And so the image you see here is an image from one of my colleagues, Glenn Smucker, who has over 30 years experience. And so he tries to emphasize the importance of using the ravines. It's a shared water resource that at the smallest unit can be transformed to be a really amazing uh, plot of land, the plot of farmland and agroforestry plots. And so going hand in hand with technical design is adaptation to local context. And this was primarily expressed through statements emphasizing the need to not only plan and design projects in Haiti, but the need for them to also evolve in Haiti. You have to see it go through the challenges, be tested, because while it might have been successfully planned until you see it play out over a couple of years, is it really successful? You won't know. And so one person said, and the quote at the bottom says, any project that is devised in your office in Miami or New York or Port-au-Prince, and I add DC to that list, is going to fail. It needs to be made with the people on the ground. You need the people that are going to be adopting this to make the actual program with you. And so this is my favorite meme of the side-eye baby. <laughs> but another 
part that came up in the data was skepticism and paternalism. And so you want to ensure that you are not designing a project that will lead to dependency on foreign aid, but also to get the respect of people, you have to come correct. You know, um, the picture middle, as I, as I will indicate, is not a part of my data collection. It's just one of my favorite memes. But this meant you can't come on coming to expensive, you know, Land Rover, uh, Tet Beth for my Haitians, the expensive ones. You can't pull up in that, stay at a fancy hotel and just say, hey, I'm here for a project. What do you what do you think about it? It's not going to work. They're either going to take advantage of it and know that you're coming, just give money, give aid, and then when you're gone, that's it. And so there are organizations that were intentionally avoiding this model and just came to just build up what people were already doing. So established grassroots organizations were becoming a model that external funders were providing capacity to. And so I want to share one of my favorite quotes from a non-Haitian man that has over 30 plus experience. He actually is an amazing uh, researcher that I used for my master's. And so um, I'll sip my water again while you guys read this because I can't read all of it. Um, but what he describes here is that the business as usual model with international development aid, particularly those that are bilateral, multilateral, is that in low and middle in in low and middle income countries where there's limited resources, limited funding, you often have to sell yourself to get what you need, which is money. And so we all know this. We all know the very large 50 million plus 100 million projects. It, I, I, I won't say on, on, on the microphone, but they're not really practical sometimes. And so this person is explaining exactly that. And, and I want to emphasize that he is not Haitian. He is not even black. So if someone that is not black is saying this and he held a very high position in one of these agencies, then uh, it speaks some power to that, right? And so I have now demonstrated to you all some essentials to planning and designing natural resource management practices in Haiti. And so to bring it all together, I now share a conceptual framework for scaling the impact of natural resource management program. We have the various stages of program life cycle interacting with each other. We also have the conceptual factors that were found to be the most influential at each stage. And so you'll see here, I didn't get to go through all the stages, but you'll see that in the dissemination stage, uh, looking at monitoring evaluation and doing some more planning is critical before you try to scale it out some more. Like, is there really a proof of concept here before you go on cruise control and claim that it's made to be sustainable? But when we consider the lessons learned and the design principles, we get this. Allow me to briefly take you on this journey here. So first here, check the legend. Uh, see on your top right over here. So the legend here, my soccer fans, you know, red means really bad and yellow means bad enough, but you got, still got to stop the game. And so you plan and design, right? Right here. And then before piloting, you ask yourself, is this culturally relevant? Was it designed with locals? And if not, red card, move back, all right? Then you actually implement your innovation or your program. And, and this pink zone is the evolution zone or the evolving zone where you actually implement and evolve watch the in innovation or program evolve in the context and you learn lessons and you ask yourself several other questions as well. And then a key question you must ask yourself um, is does this project solely depend on external actors or resources? In other words, if something was to change in terms of funding, would it be able to sustain itself? And that's where we are at, at the yellow flag before reaching sustainability. Ask those questions before you uh, try to claim that it's sustainable because when funding is cut, it gets a little tough. And so very quickly, I'd like to go over the last um, objective. And the research question was, to what extent is Haiti's landscape? Oh, I missed something as well. Um, on the bottom of this uh, conceptual diagram here, what you have on the bottom right under sustainability is the idea that once you sustain your, your own cruise control, and you're trying to figure out what's next. How do I bring more programs or diversify the intervention to bring more complementary um, innovations that will make it more sustainable or more impactful? But also on the other side, uh, while you're planning and designing, you want to think about your, your sustainability plan. What are you attempting to do? And just start brainstorming, like, how do you get here as you're designing here? So I missed that. So 
moving back on to the, to what extent is Haiti's landscape suitable for implementing community-based agroforestry health models to scale out planetary health benefits? Again, scaling out means to geographically reach more places and people. And so the layers that I use for this, I'll, I'll, I'll dig in some more later, but the data that I used for this model was 19 layers based on the case study data that I collected. I identified several factors, both landscape and social that, that would affect the physical spread of innovations. And so I have 19 layers here and the middle column is the score or the multiplier that I applied for each layer. And so let's look at the gang territory layer that has a score of three. And so is a kidnapping layer, a score of three meaning this matters way more then uh, let's say if there's a cell phone tower nearby, so for obvious reasons. And so I do wanna indicate that one of the departments, departments is what the state level level is in Haiti. And so West or West is the where the capital is. And of course that's where everything is centralized and, and concentrated. So the model did not work for this, the way it would have worked had I put everything because then it made this the capital area, the most suitable, which is not because the gangs are, kind of dominating that landscape. And so just to describe what a weighted suitability model is, it's when you, just general terms, take several layers that each tell a story about a variable you know affects an outcome. Then you use your prior knowledge and a literature review as well on the subject. You then overlap all these layers to create one layer. And that one layer tells you where those preferred conditions are. And then you can select or use it to apply it to whatever it is you're going to apply it to. And so, for example, I spoke about gangs just now. And so I found a map that was created by some like um, civil society organization. And I created my own digital map of where the gangs are. And from there, what you see is the green part um, here is showing you where the, how close you are to the gangs. And the red part means you're, you're as far as possible from the gangs. Now, when you transform it, which, which is when you like actually apply the suitability and so clearly it's going to inverse and so you have the gang territories now being a red hot zone like avoid this and the parts further away are now green and so when you have all these layers you transform them it creates uh something that's on the right side and so what you see here uh you probably can see from here as well the capital area has a lot of red marks right and so this was done at the department level for two reasons the first one is because my laptop has its limits. Uh, you cannot do a national level <laughs> analysis with 19 layers on this uh, here at Dell. Um, but it was also validated by the case study. And everyone said that feasibility of any project or suitability of any project doesn't, you can't do it nationally. It has to be at the department level. You need to take it down one region or even bring it down localized to watershed level. So the more ideal case would have been doing watershed level analysis. But it was done by 10 departments and then combined here, all of them together. And so I do wanna note that these political boundaries do not determine landscape factors. They bleed into each other. They're, they're not explicit, but you now know why I had to uh, divide it by 10 departments. And of course, my favorite, my favorite line, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, so that protects me. And so just to give a little bit more detail when I went to compare what the model was showing with like the satellite imagery, I realized, okay, so the model is still preferring uh, areas that are low elevation in a way, um, but also not the driest. Um, and so what you see here, you'll see over here, it looks quite dry on this side. And that's also where it's the most, like, the least suitable, right? And so just a couple of other observations. Um, the range of suitability was wide. You had as low as 57 scoring, and as high as 289, and that was within all departments. And as I mentioned earlier, high elevations uh, weren't the most suitable. It's hard to get up there. But also being far from urban centers, which I was not surprised by, um, also meant that you that the area was least was not as suitable. West department because of the gangs uh, made it the least suitable department, and the central department was the most suitable. And the areas of least suitability also, when you look at other maps of vulnerabilities, are the, the ones that have the least, I mean, the, the most development challenges. So that brings in another problem that future research could look at because it's time for me to go. And so some conclusions as I wrap up this seminar presentation. Um, to responsibly scale impact in a place like Haiti, there needs to be integration of natural resource management and health. At the same time, we need to be strategic and reflective at each stage of the program's life cycle. Also, Haiti's landscape is quite heterogeneous. 
demanding that we consider suitability before planning to scale. And finally, as we close out, uh, I want to offer some policy recommendations. And this, these two slides are primarily for the state of Haiti. Oh, I first recommend that the Haitian state declares health a human right in order to cure the injustices that have been made, have been done to it, and cause it to fail and fall behind in development. Reparations, reparations are not coming. The scale and magnitude of slavery is too, is too much. I don't think any higher power country is going to admit and give reparations. But if any business or international agency, which is a business, wants to operate in Haiti, there needs to be a strict requirement that health is a requirement of every intervention, but also that they're giving a lot of money to the health fund that they can start because 150 million or 50 million dollar projects are failing. Most of that could have gone to health and still had some impact. And so who you see here on this slide is Paul Farmer. Paul Farmer is probably one of the most respected Americans to have ever stepped foot in Haiti. He is also the pioneer of the global health equity movement, which strived to get healthcare to contexts where people would be neglected. Secondly, to the state of Haiti still, there needs to be stricter guidelines for implementing international development in Haiti. The country is not a free for all. There cannot be several NGOs doing the same thing in the same area, not coordinating. And also that there just needs to be a stakeholder mapping requirement so that we don't cause dependency on foreigners and have projects that still fail and somehow still get funded, even though they're failing. <laughs> I can't name them because I'll probably get pulled out. Anyways, societal recommendations. Uh, for society, I know it can seem really hard to be like, I can't do anything for Haiti. Haiti's a, it's a lost cause. Uh, so if you're not sure how to contribute to Haiti I, or feel like you're tired of giving money, I encourage you to learn about Haiti. Go beyond the headlines of Western media. I hear of Haiti fatigue, and but the real fatigue, pardon this really bad you know, statement, but the real fatigue was what slavery did and what slaves on plantation had to endure from sunrise to sundown. I'm not tired. And so also, as I exit Cornell, Cal, GNRE, throughout my time here, there haven't been, I guess, a project like this. And so I also haven't observed another student exiting. And so I don't want to use this moment to emphasize that places like Haiti and Sub-Saharan Africa are not playgrounds. Uh, I have learned that myself, even though I'm from Haiti. So it's not playgrounds for our research. Please put some respect on Haiti and some respect on Sub-Saharan Africa and on Black people who are today what they are because of this crime called slavery. We are labeled aggressive and we speak up about these matters, but you got to do it. And so I look forward to dedicating my life to the most vulnerable. Again, I have several books here if you guys want to take a picture of them to learn more about these contexts. But on a much more lighter and happier note, art, Haitian art, Haitian music, Ironically, I wouldn't be here without Haitian music. I, and that is a real fact. My friends that are online, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, I wouldn't be here without compa. I love my Haitian music. And it's if, if you like any instruments, it's a band type style of uh, music. If you like any instruments or bands, it's very nice. If you like rock as well, it's very, uh, has some common things. And so as I move forward with my life, I see myself more in policy. And so as Trona mentioned earlier, my colleagues and I founded a, think tank in Haiti. And so another way to support this kind of work is to support think tanks. In this case for Haiti, support a Haitian-led think tank that can provide a, you know, culturally relevant uh, policy recommendations. And uh, some references, I see something in the chat going on, um, references. And my tribe, I am finally done. I have not cried today, which is why I cried earlier. This has been the brokest time of my life. I will never be this broke again. <laughs> Again, Ithaca is not, yeah, it's not affordable to me. And so I thank you all. Our PhD is done. I am done. And I am outside. So invite me out now and I get a job again. <laughs> so I thank you all and Q&A. And that's just me in the field with my high value trees. And I thank you all. I'm surprised you all showed up today because this weather alone was like, uh, but it is Thanksgiving. It is a holiday. I still eat on that holiday, even though I don't like the holidays roots, but thank you all. I really appreciate my time here. I had a privilege studying this. Shorna, Steve, 
Jen, Mark, Luis, thank you for going on this really this journey with me. It was a, it was hard, and um, I look forward to the next step, the next steps of my career. Thank you all. So, is there anything in chat? We have something pop up. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So we'll we'll get to the the, the Zoom soon. Uh, I see CCC see, see, raise your hand. Is there any questions in the room in the meantime? Co-chair of the seminar committee, I'm supposed to say that I really that we're asked to uh, ask the first question. If no. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Charlie. Then Ginger. <laughs> um, thanks. I mean, it's it's so wonderful. You know, I've seen bits and pieces of, of the work and how it's worked over the years. And it's so I'm sorry I came in a bit late. Um, and I definitely may be asking you stupid questions, but um, so if it was just meant to me earlier in the presentation, just say that. Sure. Yeah, but I really loved, I thought the, the kind of heat mapping at the end was really effective. And from the, the post conflict uh, areas I've worked in, yeah, I, I see why you've attached such a high number to the, yeah. the gang presence and, and the SPD. The question I had was to what extent are those. Um, are those gang terrorist groups mobile or fixed? You know, do you see the snap uh, as it's one snapshot in time and do you see it being updated and changed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. So that was a very stupid question. I said it already. I'm joking. But the question was, so that they didn't hear it, to what extent uh, are the gang territories that I mapped out and are affecting the actual scaling out? Is that fixed? Is it dynamic? Is it likely to change? And so the response to that, it's a moment in time, but due to the fact that the capital area has a lot of uh, businesses and things that are of interest to the elite that you never see but are existing, it's likely to still remain like that for some time because there's some things that they have to take control of, some properties, but also uh, it's also where the major port is. So you can imagine what's coming in and going out without people actually opening the containers. So it'll be like that for some time, but... I always say this is kind of the internal part, I guess the internal issue of Haiti, because there's also important areas in other parts of the country, but the gangs aren't there. So the capital, so, there's something there that they have to control and monitor. And so for now, I think it'll stay like, it'll stay like that for a bit, um, but that was not a stupid question. Thank you, Charlie. No problem. Ginger? I had a question about the, um, you, you alluded in the, I think it was in the first section, about there being kind of a lack of social safety in some of the communities where you um, were studying, and that through participation in these broader projects, it kind of helped to, um, to address some of that. And I'm, I'm just curious about what was underlying that condition yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, good. Good question. Well, I didn't hear it. The question was about uh, to what extent or what were the social conditions like prior to the implementation of these like community-based programs that uh, created this, I guess, lack of distrust or um, non-cohesive type of uh, social structure. And so, honestly, it, it really goes all the way back to, you know, slavery. So. The system of distrust. You have people that were bred to be different colors, different classes. You start with that. That's rolled over. And because Haiti was, uh, Haiti created this, uh, Haiti had abolished slavery so early, the effects of those were very clear even then. And so we start with that. Then you have people that they're living on these very degraded hillsides. You know, they're cutting trees because there's nothing else to do. You now have to fight over tree resources. You have to fight over informal land tenure because the state can't manage land tenure. Then of course you have distrust in external people. You know, the, there are places all over Haiti where the state doesn't ever go to. They don't trust anyone outside of the communities. And so there's this internal conflict with people that are living with each other that they're just trying to make it work, but they don't trust each other. And so even for example, there was a very ridiculous uh, situation that happened where um, a more mixed looking Haitian person living in rural Haiti was told to leave his apart to leave his land because 
the people thought that he was stopping the rain from coming. And because he's light skinned, it's like, okay, he's like one of those, whatever. So there's a lot of going on. A part of it is also miseducation, but it really stems back to this whole system of distrust that was established through this slavery situation, but also livelihood activities are so limited. So thank you, Ginger. And so I did see a question in the chat from uh, Maya Lynn. Uh, I think I saw that. Oh, sorry, C to C, sorry. Yeah. Let me see what she just said. I see someone raising their hand. Okay. Oh, hang on. Okay. Just a second. I'll go ahead, community to community. Let me see. Unmute. Hello. Are you able to hear me? I can, my. Wonderful. Um, two things. First, Gloria, on behalf of community to community. Um, myself and Olivia and Eugene and everyone who knew you were going to rock this. Uh, congratulations. And thank you for including us in this great work that you are doing. Um, my question to you is, where would you like your work to go next? And whose hand should it be so that it can be executed at any level? Yeah. Thank you, Mari. And of course, now I'm gonna start crying because I'm hearing my people from the, you know. Honestly, I mean, during these tough times, I'm not sure who knows what, but things are really tough in Haiti right now. Um, there's this whole security mission that's happening or not happening. I don't have anything to say about that because I'm not the one in Haiti suffering. But um, in 2019, I moved to Haiti to study and do my field work. I moved right back because things got horrible. But my my who just spoke just now, she is who I spoke of, who her father inspired her to go back to Haiti after the earthquake to do the work that she does now. And so I found the most impact across those organizations. It's Haiti Friends, Community to Community, uh, Partners in Agriculture. The small scale projects are doing the big things. It's, it's surprising to see what 150,000 can do when 150 million is just half or most of it is still just supporting the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy or the, the infrastructure to get a project established in Haiti. And so for me, I hope that my community partners are on board, are on this call, whoever working at the local level are on this call. We need to uplift the grassroots movement, the grassroots uh, organizations that have already had the proposals in place. It's quite fascinating, but they're not being heard by funders. I hope that this work that I do, it will be translated um, and that it gets in the hands of the community partners and community-based organizations. I mean, they're really doing what these big orgs are not doing. And it's tough to see that, but that's where I want my work to go. And so thank you for that, Mari. Matt, I, I might have seen your hand, Matt. I don't know if I saw that. But um, I see questions. Um, maybe one second, folks. So Jim, okay. So Jim asks, how could the fight, what time is it? Okay, you guys, oh, I really <laughs> did a good job. Okay. Uh, wow, okay. Someone asks, how could the findings of this study be utilized to enhance the lives and knowledge of simple peasants? Uh, just so FYI, peasant is not like a derogatory term, derogatory term. It's actually just lifestyle that people live in Haiti in certain parts. So smallholder farmers, pretty much. Uh, how could the findings of this study be utilized to enhance the lives and knowledge of simple peasants striving to maintain agricultural practices to reach agricultural professionals who's also thriving to align themselves to sustainably and environmentally protective practices? And thank you, Jim. And so one of my uh, end goals with this project is to create these very short, simple, digestible, like, whether it be policy briefs or just uh, in infographics that will be translated into Creole and different languages. That's the first thing I think to communicate something with visuals, especially dra uh, graphs and tables, it, it, it helps policy people. <laughs> they don't like to read. They're like, just give me an image and I'll have my staff person work on it after if it, if it makes sense. And so definitely producing those materials for Haiti Policy House for sure. And just hoping for a better day so that folks like me and folks that like you, Jim, Jim is actually a really amazing person in Haiti. He's studying a lot of agroecology. And so I thank you, Jim, for doing all that. And so people like you, Jim, in my network, uh, expanding the network, sharing these things out, for creating digital material that although I can't be on the ground, can be shared remotely. And so thank you, Jim, for that question. I see a lot more questions. I'm gonna try just to do a couple. Um, thank you, uh, Onyla. Uh, Steve, my brother. Oh, okay. Playing outside, enjoying. He, he, he says, he's talking about us growing up in Haiti, playing outside. 
uh, he asked me if, if I offered a role in Haiti to become a teacher or teach more Haitians in Haiti, we take that role. Of course, of course. Uh, we have a big house in Haiti that I can't actually go to right now. Uh, uh, Renny, I see your hands up. Hi, um, Renny John, Paul Atlantic, grad, Western Studies Party. I had a quick question. Um, I'm from Trinidad, also in the Caribbean, and what I'm seeing happen in the Caribbean right now in Trinidad is like getting people to do the work, right? And it's interesting. How did you get by? Because that you have different levels of buying that you have to go through. The leader, the buying from the leader, you have the leader now say, hey, this is that other type of buying that yeah. you need. How did you get by from that initial leader? Yeah. Sometimes that's like just getting to one person is like a, a peak. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Especially in Trinidad, because Trinidad was really industrial and they moved away from agriculture and, and stuff like that. So nobody wants to do that. I went back. I'm seeing all this fresh food and I'm happy <laughs> that everybody's running to the fast food and nobody wants to go to do the farming and stuff anymore. So how do you get buy-in, especially on the community level? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I'm going to combine my master's and um and my PhD stuff. So like several people said in the in the case study, it's these networks of leaders. Um Without them, you're not getting in. You're not getting in. And you, I first started by getting access to these like trusted organizations, uh, these long-standing ones. You're long-standing only if you're trusted and reputable. So that's the first thing. Then you have the community leaders that they worked with because they knew. Oh, without the leaders, you're not you're not getting in the communities. And the leaders themselves, then once they approve, once they get your vibe, they they start bringing their people in communities. And so Mai, who just asked the question about where I want my work to go after, whose hands? Her partner, I mean, her community partner, it was just him for years that he would let show. And then after about, what, I would, I would think five, six, eight years, then he let everyone on his team show their faces because the distrust is real. And so it's not, a, it, they have to see you come back several times to trust you. And so that's, that was a buy-in for that. And you honestly think Haitian music is better than Latin music? <laughs> <laughs> Renny just said, do I honestly think that Haitian music is better than Trinidad music? So uh, let me tell you something. I did go through a Trinidad phase. I don't know if my, my person's online, but I did go through a Trinidad phase, but I'm in Haitian mode now, messy. And so I see another question here. Thank you so much for your I'm a first year, so I'm still trying to figure out my topic. And I'm just wondering, how do you choose your research topic? Um, because obviously you know the area, you know the researchers a lot, mm -hmm. but how do you choose your research topic? Which one is the most important? Yeah, yeah. Great question. And it's a great question to probably end this off in if I have more time. I'm going to hold you. The, compa, the Haitian music got me here first. I'm not going to hold you. you. It definitely did. But Summer 2018, I was able to get in touch with the organization Haiti Friends who opened their hands, opened their doors, just said, hey, come on in, come learn. And so they offered me the chance to learn about adoption behavior. I was primarily concerned about why are they adopting this? Why are they doing it? What stops people from cutting trees? I was very naive. I was actually a birder first. So I would have been a bird person if I didn't go back to Haiti. But and so the master's level, I learned about the behavior of adopting agroforestry, why they were doing it, how did they get involved in it? But when that was my first time going to the province, the, the rural areas, and uh, I didn't know poverty was that bad. You see open wounds, you see people with infants walking hours up the hill. I'm struggling to walk up the hill, but they're just baby in hand. You see people that don't know that they have right to have human health or healthcare access. And so the severity of health really just having like, oh, okay, trees and all, but what about health? And so. When I learned, when I, when I got more deeper and deeper in the health side of things, because I don't know about you guys, I have a headache, I can't function. There are people that are living with open wounds, and I'm, Marie's org works on dent, dental care. Apparently, gums can kill you, like bad gums, if you don't take care of them, will kill you. So there are people dying from things that we are not dying from here. And of course, HIV AIDS is still a problem. And so for me, knowing my privilege here, I have access to all the health care I can get. Um, expensive, but... I have access to it. And so that was the shift. And that was where I was like, how do I now incorporate health into natural resources? What's out there? Oh, planetary health. And of course I have folks in my committee that were engaged in that. And so that was how it came to be. It was more so me realizing that health is a human right. It's not accessible in these contexts due to certain historical events that took place. And that's what I'm devoting my life to now, health. Um, I can't go a day without being healthy and to know that people are living unhealthy and not aware that they're supposed to be healthy. 
it's heartbreaking. But that's what got me here. And so I will end this off now. I had several other questions. I love you guys. I couldn't get to it. Mark, you'll ask me that during the defense. But thank you all. <laughs> the defense, yeah. <laughs> but thank you again, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I am going to drink what Elena got me today. And uh, you guys have a great rest of your week. Enjoy your holiday. And I look, I look forward to seeing where this goes. All right. All right, thank you all online, and you guys can send me my cash check my Zelle soon. Okay, bye guys. <laughs>